We're going to be going to uh, the 21st chapter of the book of Acts. That's where we'll pick up the story here. But I'd like to just take a moment. I like to do this occasionally and just bring uh, just a little bit of a review is it, by way of introduction. So we've mentioned in the past that the book of Acts covers about 35 years of history. The book is primarily historical and transitional, although we all know that there are several doctrinal controversial issues that are put forth in the book, and we've discussed uh, many of them, or probably discussed all of them uh, thus far. The book of Acts chronicles the actions, that's where the name comes from, the actions of the apostles. There are two primary spokespeople in the book. The first is the apostle Peter, and he pretty much monopolizes the first 12 chapters of the book, and then chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas are sent on their first missionary journey, and Paul becomes a central figure of the rest of the book of Acts. A um, lot of transitions in this book. Transition from Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, to his disciples. The Old Testament ends as we understand it. The New Testament begins. Israel is the focal point of the history of the Bible up until the time of Christ and through the time of Christ. And um, now we see the church coming into focus, probably being established in uh, the 38th verse of Acts chapter 2. We see the kingdom issues, Israel, uh, also moving to what we understand now in the New Testament as the body of Christ. We see the gospel moving from Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth, as was uh, prescribed by the Lord Jesus in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And the central geographical location of the um, ministry of the kingdom of God and gospel in this early church uh, moves from the city of Jerusalem to the city of Antioch, where Paul and Barnabas were commissioned on the first missionary journey in Acts chapter uh, number 13. So what we're going to do, as I said, we're going to pick uh, the story up in the 21st chapter of the book of Acts, if you turn there. And uh, if you have a notebook, I'm going to ask you to follow along in your notebook. Uh, and we're going to begin on page 251 in the notebook. So you can find that place, but if you would just for a moment, uh, go right back to keep your finger there in 251, but go back to, to uh, page number four in your notebook. It's in those early pages that we give you a table of contents. We've kind of spelled out the book in uh, bite-sized pieces here. Uh, it, if you want to see where we're going to be at 251, you can see at the bottom of page number four, Acts chapter 21. This will give you an idea of what we have covered already. We've covered four pages of these outlines almost, and we really have page number five and just one entry on page number six. So to say that we're 80% of the way through, uh, this is uh, certainly uh, no exaggeration whatsoever. But you can see here at the bottom of page number four, you can see what we'll be looking at in Acts chapter 21. Uh, I try to bring an introduction in uh, every uh, entry, every session. Then Paul is warned about going to Jerusalem. I mean, we're many, uh, Paul's been ministering now for several years, and consequently, he has a great or grave reputation, depending on which side of the coin uh, you fall on. But uh, when it comes to Christianity, he has a great reputation, a great ministry. But when it comes to the Jews specifically, they see him as an enemy, not just an enemy of their um, religion, but an enemy of their, um, their history and their traditions and everything else, to the point that they have in the past and will continue, as we read on, they will continue to plan to assassinate Paul, to get rid of him. Paul is warned not to go to Jerusalem, 
We see a man named Agabus who prophesies, warns Paul in chapter 21, and then he uh, conforms to Jewish customs and traditions. He goes to Jerusalem, even against the warning of Agabus and probably other people. He sees a great opportunity in Jerusalem. Um, there will be hundreds of thousands of Jews gathering uh, in Jerusalem. This will be a great opportunity for him to preach to them and share Christ with them. And uh, so, uh, not to mention that he can go there and he can fulfill, for the Jews' uh, sake, he could fulfill within conscience, within his conscience, those things which would still be acceptable as a Christian in these Jewish traditions. Well, there's a great uproar that takes place. Paul is arrested. He seems to be the central figure. The Jews have risen up to accuse him of all kinds of things, including treason against the Roman government. And uh, Paul begins his defense at the end of chapter number 21. So, Let's go back to page 251, if you will. Let's look at the introduction to this particular chapter, if you would, with me. We come to the ch chapter 21, and Paul is about to wrap up the third missionary journey. His journeys have been the focus all the way back to chapter 13 up until now, and he has spent about 14 years now traveling over these three journeys, about 6,000 miles. Can you imagine that? Going across the country, the United States of America and back, not in an automobile, an airplane or train, but in very primitive transportation modes for sure. He's going to go to uh, Jerusalem. It's his desire to go there to celebrate Pentecost. But he's warned of the impending danger that he will face there. And the whole episode, which begins here in chapter number 21, is going to earn him an all-expense-paid trip to Rome to stand before the emperor himself to plead his cause. But Paul sees this as a win-win, if you please. If he goes to Jerusalem and the warnings are correct that he is going to uh, be assassinated, lose his life. He's very satisfied that he has done what uh, the Lord has commanded him to do. He has fulfilled his responsibility. He understands that. So be it. However, he has the opportunity to go there and preach, and he'll probably have the opportunity to preach to as many or maybe more individuals that he, uh, than he ever has at any other time in his life. There could be as many as a million different uh, Jewish individuals gathered in Jerusalem at the time of Pentecost. So when it comes to, to Paul in his attitude towards this whole thing, although he's been warned, he sees that this is a win-win situation. Sometime later, Paul wrote to his protege Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, these words recorded on 251. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. And uh, if you have the, the, uh, the PowerPoint slides, you can see there in the parentheses, this is a time to just take a moment and review the three trips that Paul has been on. We see the outline. We looked at this in the table of contents at the bottom of the page. And then Paul is warned concerning Jerusalem. So let's read these first six verses here. It came to pass that after we were gotten from them and had launched, we came with a straight course unto Coas. And the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence unto Patara. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set forth. Now when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unlade or unload her burden. 
And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. They were afraid. They knew that there were people out there, Jews who were out there, and they were uh, planning uh, to assassinate him, to eliminate him. And when he had accomplished those days, the seven days had gone by, we departed, went our way, and they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. When he, he had, and when we had taken our leave one of another, we took ship and they returned home again. You see the word leave there in verse number six in the military when you get some time off you are granted leave. You ha have some free time, a little vacation time there. Note the we in verses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Luke, the author of Acts, is apparently accompanying Paul at this particular time. Then we can see the places where Paul has traveled. This chapter moves very quickly. In fact, the rest of the book moves very quickly because it's primarily a narrative. We're not going to get stuck in a lot of controversial issues, things like that. We're going to just kind of read the story, the narrative of what took place in Paul's life as his public ministry, as we understand it, uh, comes to an end in the 28th chapter. Still alive, obviously, but uh, these are, will be the last recorded words uh, in Scripture about him. So we pick up the reading of uh, chapter 21 in verse number 7. And when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Ptolemaeus and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. And the next day we, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist. You remember him? He, w he showed up all the way back. He was one of the, the uh, deacons in chapter number 6. He showed up and he shows up in chapter number 8 leading uh, the individual that we call the Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord. So we see uh, here we see Philip the evangelist which was one of the seven, one of the seven deacons and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hand of the Gentiles. So this is Agabus's object lesson to the Apostle Paul. When we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Second warning. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. If that's what God wants, I'm prepared. I feel like I've fought a good fight. I have fulfilled my purpose in life and in what God has commissioned me to do. And if this is my last stop on my journey here on earth, then so be it. That will be fine. No problem whatsoever. So in verse number uh, 14, And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, the will of the Lord be done. And after those days, we took up our carriages or luggage. It's another word for luggage. And went up to Jerusalem. There went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought with them one Nason of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. So again, we have some notes that we've put there if you want to just kind of uh, peruse through those things. Uh, Agabus is an individual that was seen earlier in the book, uh, back in chapter number 11. We talk about the daughters prophesying, and we've given you some cross-references there. Some people, when they see, uh, when they t talk about uh, women or females, they see that females have a n really no leadership uh, place 
in the gospel ministry and whatnot, and, and frankly, I don't, I don't see that myself. I see Aquila and Priscilla. I see Priscilla coming alongside her husband, dealing with and teaching uh, Apollos. Um, there are other situations. I don't, I, personally, my personal belief is that women are not to be the primary leader or preacher in a church or the, the pastor of the church. That's my own personal opinion. I have my reasons for believing that, biblical reasons. I'm comfortable with that. But I see many places and opportunities for, wis uh, for wise women to be involved in leading various uh, groups of individuals and people within the church under the auspices, under the leadership of uh, a male pastor, a male leader. Now, that may even sound like I'm a sexist because I say that, but nonetheless, that's my position. Let's look at page 253. We pick up the reading in chapter 21 in the 17th verse. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. So you can see Paul's traveling from place to place to place. And uh, one place he stops seven days, another place another day, and comes to Jerusalem. And what he's doing, he's looking for believers to confirm them, to encourage them, to answer their questions, to be among them. And it, was just, it had to be something special to have Paul the Apostle, by this time having such a, a great reputation, and a great life ministry behind him. It must have been really something to have Paul the Apostle come and actually have the opportunity to meet him, uh, ask him questions, visit with him, um, draw from his experience and from his wisdom in the ministry, and his encouragement. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 tells us that Paul went through a whole host of of uh, obstacles in physical obstacles in his ministry not to mention the people obstacles that he had to deal with and yet was always victorious he fought a good fight he kept the faith he was always an encourager wherever he went the only exception would be his dispute with Barnabas over John Mark which is many years behind us at this point so they received him gladly. Verse 18, in the day following, Paul went in with us unto James. And all the elders were present. James, the pastor of the church here. James, the Lord's brother. He, has, uh, 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 he showed up back in chapter 15 at the Council of Jerusalem, if you'll recall. And he, all, the, all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. So he gave a testimony, probably quite a lengthy testimony of all the things that God had done uh, in his ministry and that he had observed in all of his travels for many, many years, 14 years of uh, mission work. And um, now he's back in Jerusalem sharing with these Jews who have been in many of them who have been in Jerusalem going back uh, countless years at this point he visits with James and uh, he has the opportunity to share what God has done in and through his life when they heard it verse 20 they glorified the Lord and said unto him thou seest brother how many thousands of Jews there are which believe and they are all zealous of the law and they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. You are being, Paul, you are being misrepresented, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. So, Paul, there's a lot of rumors out there about what you're teaching uh, as you travel around. So James and the elders at Jerusalem encourage Paul to speak for himself. In verse uh, number um, 22, what is it therefore? The multitudes must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. People are going to know what you have to say for yourself. Do therefore this that we say to thee, we have four men which have a vow on them. Them take 
and purify them se- thyself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. So uh, these particular four individuals must have been either key individuals or they had a particular problem with Paul and um, the leadership has encouraged them to spend some time with Paul and to firsthand hear what Paul has to say and see what Paul does now that he has come to Jerusalem. As touching the Gentiles which believe, and uh, we're reading now in verse 25, is touching, um, well, no, let's go back, let's, let's read verse, verse 24 again. Ta- them take, these four, purify them thyself with them, go through the rituals, the motions, as long as they're not contradictory to what the Bible teaches. And be it charges with them, that they may shave their heads, do what they do, as long as you can do that with a clear conscience, shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing that they have been lied to. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that these are the things that are important, that they observe no such things, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols. In other words, you're not compelling the Gentiles to act like or conform to the Jewish customs to be Christians. And um, that was the issue all the way back in Acts chapter number 15 at the Council of Jerusalem. That was also the issue between Paul and Peter that Paul speaks of in uh, the book of Galatians, in Galatians chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3, which probably took place not long before what we are reading here in chapter uh, 21 of the book of Acts. Though those two, Galatians chapter 2 and Acts chapter 21, probably within a year of one another, I'm going to guess. Them take, purify themselves, as touching the Gentiles which believe, verse 25, we have written and concluded that they observe no such things, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols, and from blood, and from strangled, and from fornication. These were the simple things that were put out before the Gentiles. No, you don't have to keep all the Old Testament rites, rituals, etc., etc., but these are the things in this culture that you need to be aware of if you're going to have a good testimony as a Christian. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. So he doesn't have a problem uh, going back to his Jewish roots and conforming, as long as it's, it's not making a statement contrary to what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. We're not depending upon the law. He's going through rites and rituals or traditions that are not contrary to the scriptures. There are a lot of traditions in Christianity today, depending upon the denomination that, uh, or the group of people that you belong to. Um, among very formalistic uh, Christians, or, and I use the term very generally, um, many celebrate a time period during the year, the liturgical year, that's called Advent. Advent means coming, and the Advent is a period of time that covers a certain number of days prior to the coming of Christ, which is celebrated on Christmas Day in the Western Church. Another tradition that's celebrated by many Christians is uh, Lent, which is a period of time that precedes the, uh, uh, the, um, the resurrection of Christ or Easter Sunday. Uh, some people celebrate uh, Ash Wednesday, Good Friday, different things like that. Now, as long as what is being represented in those particular days is not anti-biblical or contrary to biblical 
uh, the biblical truth, I don't have a problem with people who celebrate those things if they want to. I, just don't force me to celebrate your Christian tradition. I may and I may not. But I don't see those things as required. And I don't see that if someone celebrates those things, that they are necessarily, you know, a pagan or heathen or uh, unchristian in doing that. Now, I know someone's going to have a problem with what I just said. So um, take a blood pressure uh, pill or something like that right now and get it down 10 or 15 points so you can get through the next, uh, uh, the rest of this particular teaching lesson, if you would. All right, let's pick, pick up the reading again in uh, verse uh, number 26. Then Paul took the men, the next day purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. By the way, I've never done that personally, but Paul did in Acts chapter 21. Was he wrong for doing that? Stop for a moment and think about that. Was he anti-Christian, unbiblical, ungodly for doing what he did? You have to think through these things. Is this really anti-biblical or not? Or is this just somebody's tradition? Well, let's pick up our reading now in verse 27 of the chapter. And when the seven days were almost ended, that is of the purification mentioned before, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. They were not happy, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people, that is against Israel, the Jewish people, and against the law implied, and against this place, the temple, and Jerusalem, and further brought Greeks also into the temple, and hath polluted this holy place. So here are the accusations initially that are being uh, leveled against the Apostle Paul. Notice the parentheses in 29, for they had seen before with him in the city Trophimus, an Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul, Paul had brought into the temple. So verse 29 is explaining a, a portion of verse 28. And all the city was moved and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. Well, this is, uh, if it's not a riot, it's on the edge of being a riot. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, who immediately, wisely, <laughs> took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them, and when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating Paul. How nice of them. They decided that it was time to stop. Let's not do this anymore. Then the chief captain, verse 33, came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. Of course, he's acting under presumption with all this uproar that's going on. This, this individual, Paul, must have done something serious, and consequently, he uh, um, handcuffs him, puts him in chains, and then demands, what did you do to get <laughs> all of these people stirred up like this? And some cried one thing and some another among the multitude when he could not know the certainty for the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. This was absolute confusion. <laughs> absolute confusion. Uh, the, uh, the, he couldn't uh, get a handle on what's this all about? Why has this happened? So many different voices, so many people saying different things, probably many of them like so often is the case in a scenario like this, many people saying things that they really didn't, they didn't get firsthand. They were just repeating what someone else said and probably didn't even understand what the real issues 
were. So, some cried one thing, 34, and when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. So, uh, the, uh, the head of the soldiers here, he decides he's going to protect him. He wants to protect the individual and find out what the issue is all about. Brings him to his own, his castle, his d um, dwelling place. You know, we have an idea of what a castle is. It isn't necessarily the same thing that we would understand in the we uh, Western world. But it was his, uh, his um, office area. It may be a small prison area, administrative area, etc., etc. But he brings Paul there. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying, Away with him! And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee, who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Art not thou that Egyptian, which before these days made an, uh, madest an uproar, and lettest out into the wilderness four thousand men that were murderers? Aren't you this guy? He assumed he was someone other than who he was. And uh, when he spoke to him in, in, in a language uh, in, uh, that was understandable to him, he said, you, you can't be the same person I'm thinking you are. But Paul said, I am a man, which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me or allow me to speak to the people. Let me speak for myself. So Paul begins in verse number 40. He begins his defense as we end this chapter. And when he had given him license, he let him do it, freedom to, to speak for himself. Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. Paul saw this as another witnessing opportunity under the protection of the Roman government. This, it, it's almost humorous, is it not, to see this. And when there was made a great silence, he spoke, spoke unto them in the Hebrew tongue. So Paul was able to communicate in probably and obviously in Aramaic, which was a common language, the Hebrew language, and probably Greek also. So uh, at least those languages and who knows how many other dialects he was able to identify with or speak. So anyway, he speaks in the Hebrew tongue saying, this is interesting and I, I, I never noticed this before, but notice that this chapter, verse 40, is the last verse of chapter uh, number 21. Notice the last word saying comma. This chapter ends with a comma. Now, I haven't ever really looked at chapters in the Bible to see if there's any other chapter in the Bible that ends in a comma, but this one does. This has to be unusual. Maybe not unique, but it's unusual. A chapter in the Bible ending with a comma, and of course, it's setting up what he is going to say next in chapter number 22. We'll find in chapter 22 his speech. So there's some applications here in this particular uh, chapter. Doing right is not always recognized or rewarded in this life. <laughs> I'm sure you've figured that out by now. There isn't a direct correlation. I do the right thing and I get blessed for it. Sometimes we do the right thing and we pay for it. It costs us something to do the right thing. Sometimes we do the wrong thing, nothing happens. We're expecting some kind of judgment for, and sometimes nothing happens whatsoever. And sometimes we're blessed just out of the blue and we think, why, you know, why did this happen? And it's just the favor and the grace of God raining down on you. But the point is this, there is no absolute direct correlation between doing the right thing and then getting an immediate Pavlovian response that you're going to get something good as a result of that. That's a lesson we can learn. At the bottom of 254, being mindful 
of in caring for the needs and perceptions of others brings unity to the body of Christ. And so we've listed some other passages here on page number 255 that uh, would uh, bring us uh, to the same conclusion. We see on 256 some other uh, passages that are listed that uh, essentially what these passages are saying on 256 are that Paul was very wise and Paul could read his audience and uh, what he did is he was wise enough to use the appropriate issues to address a crowd to get the best possible response not always a great response but the best possible response that he could Paul became a Jew if he needed to be a Jew and he wouldn't violate wouldn't violate scripture he would act in such a way among Jews in such a way that he would not irritate them or be a bad testimony give them cause to talk about him so 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9 at the top of of uh, page 256 Paul didn't want to be a stumbling block 1 Corinthians 9 20 it says and unto the Jews I became as a Jew in the end of verse 21 he says I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some he was willing to adapt to every set of circumstances verse 32 of 1 Corinthians 10 he didn't intentionally give offense to people to Jews or Gentiles in verse 33 it says even as I please all men and all things not seeking my own profit but the profit of many that they may be saved and these verses explain Paul's trip uh, his seven days of purification uh, with these four men it, he was not doing something anti-biblical he was concerned about bringing people together in Christ. Notice then, thirdly, that Paul's boldness was rooted in his win-win perspective. He really trusted God. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. Regardless of what happens, I'll be a winner. I can understand that. I can see that. So, we're coming to a conclusion here in uh, chapter number 21. We're going to pick up in just uh, in our next session we're going to pick up Paul's defense Paul begins his defense in chapter 21 verse number 40 and then we're going to see in chapter 22 he's going to give a testimony uh, uh, again uh, about uh, how he got where he is as a Christian at this particular time he's going to tell his story um, to uh, the crowd that's gathered here uh, most of them probably who uh, oppose him at this particular time an angry crowd that are only being held back because these Roman soldiers are sitting there protecting Paul while he shares with the Jewish people and the Romans his testimony so we're going to take a break right now we'll be back in just a few moments <laughs> 